Hey everyone, today we have a classic Roland D70 synthesizer. This was another eBay find. It needs a little bit of work. So the auction for this one basically said it had dead keys. It powered up in the pictures and everything else seemed to work, just a lot of the key functionality of it wasn't working on it. Besides the keys, the unit was just dirty. I actually went through and I cleaned the entire thing just because it was gross. I don't know if this was another barn unit or garage unit as I call them because it has a lot of corrosion, has some rust, it was just covered in dirt, all the keys were dirty, which is really really nasty. I didn't even want to touch it. So I went through real quick, just wiped it all up, cleaned it all up, made it look nice at least to the point where I'm comfortable touching it without just feeling dirty. And besides that, it, it cleaned up pretty nice, but there's still some light scuffs and marks throughout the synth. Uh, there's also some, it's almost like corrosion on here. Here's an overview of it that you can kind of see. It should show up on camera there. Just tiny little specks. So I need to look into that and see what I need to do to clean that up. But I'm going to go through this some more and clean it up some more too. There's still some marks in there I feel I can get out. And I, I, I still feel this can look really nice when I'm done with it. Another item to note is the LCD. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, liquid crystal bleeding on the display there. So the display still works. But I'm going to look and see if I can uh, find a replacement. There are people on eBay selling, you know, replacement LCDs for a hundred bucks, but I just need to look at the actual unit itself, figure out, figure out what the make and model of it is, and figure out what the bus interface that controls it is, so I can just source the unit myself. The this LCD is also backlit. I noticed the backlit is not working on there from the pictures that I looked at. So the D70 came out in 1990. It predates my JV80 by a few years. The D70 was the last. Roland synthesizer that was released that was part of the D-series. That was our linear arithmetic synthesizers. In this case it was a super linear arithmetic which there were some changes to it that improved it and added a couple more pieces of functionality to it. But Coming out in 1990 it was in that time running into the JV series of products which are being released just after it. Which explains why the design of them are so similar. The, the, the whole metal cover on this is almost identical to the, to the JV80. The keys themselves feel completely different though, so I think the keyboard is, is different. They're semi-weighted, but there's just a different springiness to them, and just it's hard to describe, but they just feel different than the JV80. I almost prefer the JV80 keyboard a little bit more, I think, but at the same time, this one probably has significantly more wear, and that may play into it a little bit as well. Alright, so I've got it hooked up to some speakers here so we can hear the audio, and powering it on. It does power up, which is nice. I'm not too familiar with the D-Series yet, so I still need to go through the menus a little bit and, and actually understand how to use it, but, so, i got Grand Piano sample here, so there are a lot of keys that are dead. probably 10 so far. I'll have to clean all the uh, key switches. That's common on pretty much any older synth. They wear out, they get dirty. You can usually clean them and they'll bring them back to life. I've done a couple of videos that describe on this. So the next step will be taking this apart, taking a look inside. Through this video too, I want to do a small teardown on it just to see what's inside and we can uh, take a look to see what makes it work. I'll be curious to see how much has changed from the D70 to the JV80 which came out just two years later. So it'll be interesting to compare the two inside anyway. But other than that, I'm happy with it. Again, it costs basically nothing. You're always a little more expensive to ship, but it's just how it is for bigger, heavier items. This has got some heft to it too. I will say that. This is uh, quite a bit heavier than my JV80. So I'll be curious to find out why inside. But that's it. So I will flip it over and we'll start taking it apart. All right, I've got it upside on my bench. Uh, I've got it on uh, some foam blocks here. Because actually the way the synth lays, the pitch bender itself, you'd be laying the, the whole synth on the pitch bender, which I don't want to risk breaking it. So putting on just some pieces of foam props it off of the off the bench so I don't have to worry about damaging it. Another thing that's kind of annoying is the cord is hard-coded, or hard-wired to the, to the back of the unit, which I don't really like. Most of the other rolling synths, it's, it's removable standard IEC plug or the Roland proprietary plug. At least it's not tied to it, so it kind of makes working on it difficult. The next thing I noticed is that somebody's definitely had a go at this. There are screws missing, and some of the screws that are on here aren't even screwed in all the way. So somebody has definitely already been inside, which, I mean, it's not entirely surprising, but I'll be curious to see 
what they've done there. The other thing I noticed too, when I flip this over, there's a couple screws rattling around inside, so I got to dig those out and figure out where those are. Where those are too. Maybe there's some of the screws in the back. I don't know. There's there's quite a few missing along the whole back there and some outside. So we will start to open it and figure out what's going on. The screws are rusty too. So again, tying to the fact that this was sitting somewhere where there was a lot of moisture. All right, all the screws are off, so this should lift straight up, which it does. And it looks pretty clean inside, which is good. I was worried we were going to find a lot of rust, but I don't see much. I'll pull the uh, camera over so we can take a closer look. Oh, that's interesting. Hold on, i got to bring the camera over. So. Before I get into what I saw, the, the first observation I have is that this keyboard is completely different than the JV80 keyboard. The JV80 keyboard had a physical circuit board on the bottom that was removable where actually all the contact pads for the individual keys laid so you could pull those circuit boards off and get to all the individual uh, key contacts. This you can't. It's actually a plastic uh, a flexible can't think of what the name of it actually is. It's, it's basically a printed circuit board that's on a flexible material, but it's below this whole steel frame. So I'm gonna have to pull the keyboard out and get to it from the top, and I'm gonna have to remove all the keys to get, actually get in there and do it. But that aside, what I noticed was this. So somebody wedged paper in here, most likely in an attempt to try to fix the keys that were sticking. So, and of course, moisture got in there, and there's some rust on that paper, too, but there's a bunch of them. It's not the only one. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, at least, through here. So, uh, that was someone's attempt to fix it, and that's all they do. I guess I'm happy. They're just pieces of paper. So that must have been their thought if they put more pressure underneath the actual key switches they'll work. Maybe it fixed it temporarily, but that is not how you repair these things. So I'm going to have to clean all this out. I mean, I can get to it the other side anyway, because I'm going to have to pull this whole key contact strip out too, but oh, they're all rusty as well. You see the corrosion in there. I might have to pull that whole strip off just to clean it and make sure there's no rust behind there. How strange. Alright, well, I'm going to clean up the rest of those real quick. And then we'll take a look around inside. So I cleared as much of the paper underneath the uh, key contacts as I could. I feel there's still a lot more in there. I'm going to have to wait till I get the actual keyboard disassembled before I get to get to the rest of it. Because I, I just can't reach it and I don't want to risk damaging the, uh, the PCB there. So. I'll get to that once the keyboard comes out. Uh, we'll go through the electronics in here real quick just to see what's going on. So starting with the power supply, we have classic Rowan power supply. This basic supply has been every piece of Rowan gear I've opened. This transformer is multi-tapped, just like the other gear I had. So if you need to convert this from a different voltage country, so if you have bought this from Japan, it was 100 volts, or it was in Europe at 240 volts, you need to convert it to 120 volt US. It's easy to do. I've published a video on that as well that describes how to change voltages. It's, it's basically just changing the tap on the primary. On this synth there is actually a fuse but it's on the secondary so it doesn't matter if you change the primary voltage you don't have to worry about changing the fuse as well which is kind of nice. Other than that just a simple linear power supply so you got a 5 volt regulator then a plus, plus and minus 12 volt regulator for the analog side both for the op amps and the analog digital converter. The caps are Nippon Chemicon so they're good caps in there except for this one I can't see a logo on there. I think it, it's like a Mitsubishi logo. I'm not 100% sure, but none of them look to be leaking, so which is good. They're only 85C rated, but it looks fine. I can check the uh, supply later on the outputs just for ripple, but it's probably not going to need any attention, which is nice. Regarding that power cord too, if you really wanted to, there's a plate on here that actually mounts to the back, which is actually loose. But if you wanted to put an IEC power cord and get rid of the, the hardware cord, you, it would be pretty trivial to, to add that in there, which is kind of nice as well. 
Here is the main digital board in the D70. You can see it's actually labeled D70 as well, so it was specific to the synth. At least I would imagine they wouldn't have used it in anything else, being the latest one that they produced. So, typical Roland construction. There is a lot of Roland badge chips on here. Not every one, though, which is different. The GV80, almost every single chip on there was badge Roland. This one actually has an Intel microprocessor. So, N80, C19, 6KB12. So, I believe that's a 16-bit microcontroller. I don't really know any of the specs of it. 12 megahertz which makes sense for 12 megahertz crystal right next to it. So they're running an Intel uh, microcontroller in this, which is, is different than the GV80, which all had custom rolling silicon. Along with that, we got our EEPROMs, which are running the most likely the firmware for this unit to run, along with some additional ROM and RAM there, uh, one of them being battery backed up by this 3-volt lithium here. And then on this side, these are most likely our ROM chips for the actual synth synthesis. All rolling branded as well, which is just interesting to see. All right, so date codes, everything looks to be 1990. So ninth week, 1990, ninth week, 1990, sixth week, 1990. Yeah, everything's 90. So mine was at least built 1990. Could be later. I don't know exactly for sure. I didn't see any other stickers on the outside that, that outlined anything. The digital analog converter does not look to be on this board. There's a separate analog board actually which looks to have it actually it does I see it right now I'll show it in a second this so the LCD and the front control panel are buried under everything here and this I believe is the HV supply for that for that actual LCD backlight so I might be able to I want to look see if I can replace that backlight even if I can't source the LCD in it the LCD still works it just doesn't look as nice as I would like it to that's all but besides that you've got let's see all these cables here go off to looks like the analog board and then these two ribbons are going to the actual keyboard itself, which is looks like it comes out pretty simple. Shouldn't be as much to tear down as there was in the JB80. All right, we'll go over and look at the analog board. Here we are at the analog board. This is to the far right of the synth, and you can see this this cable, this shielded cable here, is actually carrying the digital data from the digital board to the analog board. And this is our DAC right here. It's a Burr Brown PCM56. So. This is a 16-bit DAC, which is actually different. Uh, it's a different DAC than a lot of the other Roland gear I've looked at. Uh, first of all, being 16-bit, it's really high quality. It's also interesting because this is not a stereo DAC. It is a mono DAC. There's only a single digital analog converter in that chip. So what they're doing is they're actually chopping the digital audio coming in between the left and right channels actually on the output. And my guess is they're probably doing that with this chip here, which is a 4052. I believe that is a multiplexer. So Roland again is using good quality DAX in their in their equipment. These uh, these bird round chips are expensive at the time, uh, especially with 16-bit resolution. So they they definitely put money into the quality of the audio output, which, which is really nice. The rest of this board contains JRC op amps, most likely. We got four actual audio outputs on here, plus the headphone output. So there's two primary left and right stereo, and there's also two auxiliary that you can probably assign to different instruments or something. I'll have to look at the manual. I'm not entirely sure, but that's typically what you see on, on synths like that that have the multiple outputs. But other than that, nothing too exciting on there. So that's about it for that board. I did dig those two screws. There's actually two screws in here that were bouncing around that I found. They were both buried down in here, so when I flipped it over they just ended up on this side of the synth. And I think they go... So of course I just dropped one, but I think they went right here. Because it looks like there's two uh, two holes that actually go to the maybe I don't know maybe not I'll have to figure out where these go so they're they're from somewhere in here I don't know where yet but the next steps are going to be to start taking this apart so I can get this keyboard assembly out it looks like I'm only going to have to take out these top three boards and that's it so this should come apart a lot easier than some of the other things I've worked on. Once I get the keyboard model out, I can flip it over, then start tearing that apart to get to these key contact switches. I'm not going to take pictures of this one. It actually, it's pretty simple in terms of the wiring. Every connector is a different size, too, so you can't mistakenly plug one into the wrong slot, which is nice.
keyboard came out actually extremely easily. Once I had the boards removed, there was only six screws holding the whole thing down. The lower cover is actually what supports all the weight of it. So with all the screws removed when you took the bottom off, there was only a couple screws actually holding it in, which made it come out really, really easy. To remove the keys out of this synth is actually pretty straightforward. You press down on the key and you slide it forward, and then you lift up on the back, and then you actually slide the key out to the front. There's a metal spring that sits in every single one of the keys here. Putting this back together is kind of a chore. It's not terrible, but it's not as easy as some of the synths where you have the actual little spring on the back holding the key for the actual tension. To, re to put them back in, you lay this piece of metal in place, and then you slide the key on, putting this underneath the front portion here. Line up the metal tab, pull it forward, push down, let it lock into place, and then it's restored. All these keys are actually number two for the key position that they are, so when you pull these off, just keep them in order. If you mix it up, you can still figure out how to get back together. It's not a terrible thing, but it's a pain because you got to take every single key off to get to the rubber membranes underneath it, which I'm going to start doing here now. All right, all the keys are removed. A couple notes with this too is I left all the springs in place. There's no reason, real reason to take them out. They just kind of rest there. I'm not going to be flipping this upside down, so there's just less chance of, of, of losing them. Then secondly, all these actual springs have a little bit of grease on there. It's almost like some type of white lithium grease. So I've got some plastic safe greases. I think I'm going to wipe all of this off and replace it. Some of it's really dirty. There's a lot of nasty dust and there's dirt in there on it, so I'll clean all that up and reapply it. Uh, surface rust, there is quite a bit of little surface rust on here, so I'll go through and just kind of clean all that up as well as much as I can, along with all the dirt. Because, you know, on the keys, all your dirt falls in between the keys and ends up on this board. And that's why I get so filthy and nasty in here. So I'm going to clean everything up as much as I can. Uh, the important part is I'm down to the actual rubber, rubber membranes. So here's a close-up of the actual key switches. The actual little rubber contacts just have little rubber pins that, that line up in the holes on this metal backplane. So if you carefully pull them right at where they're connected, you can pop them out without damaging anything. There's quite a few on there that hold them in place. I'm just going to get that top row now. Just want to be careful because you don't want to damage these. Okay, and it's off. So looking at the key contact switches, you can see that there's a little bit of dirt and kind of residue on there on them. And then the board side as well, look, another piece of paper wedged in there. But these need to be cleaned as well. So we'll clean all these actual contacts with isopropyl alcohol and then do the same for the contacts here. I've used isopropyl alcohol to clean these contacts for years and never had any trouble with it doing it. It's, it's safe to use on this type of rubber. People say that it isn't, but it's fine. I've never had a problem even years and years later. Some, some of them 10 years ago, I cleaned these contacts and um, they're still working just fine today. But I'm gonna have to lift up this entire strip so I can get the rest of these stupid pieces of paper that are wedged under there out. So looking under this actual strip here of the, the, the key contacts, you can actually see all the little rust spots where those stupid pieces of paper were sitting under there. It's so annoying. So I'm going to clean this up as much as I can just to make sure it, it doesn't deteriorate any further. But again, it's just a, annoying that somebody stuffed paper in there. And this is the result of that stupid mistake. As you're cleaning these contacts on the, on the actual keyboard key switches, you only need to rub very gently. You don't need to put much force. If you do put excessive force on it, you will start to remove some of the carbon layer. So you definitely do not want to put force onto this as you're doing it.
All right, I'm starting the reassembly process. So in the meantime, I went through and I cleaned every single contact on these strips. And then I cleaned every single pad on all the actual uh, rubber switches themselves. Got rid of all the residue, got rid of all the dust and dirt in there that was preventing contact. Real quick too, while I have this open, I can kind of explain the way that velocity on these works. The velocity sensitivity on the synthesizers isn't based at all on something detecting how hard you press the key. It's all based on timing. In these pads, you'll notice that one is slightly higher than the other. What happens when you press a key is the higher one strikes first, followed by the lower one, which strikes the second set of pad. And the matrix, the way that these are set up on, that goes back to the processor that, that interprets the keystrokes, works strictly based on timing. When you press the key very softly, the time between that first pad hitting and the second pad hitting is a little bit longer than when you strike the key hard and that first pad hits and the second pad hits almost, you know, rate, a lot quicker right after the first pad hit. So the, Microsoft, the microprocessor in there actually looks at the timing of every one of these keystrokes and that's how it interprets the velocity of how hard you're hitting the key. So putting this back together, it's important that you orientate these the same way that they came out. That is, you got to make sure that they go in this way and not this way because if you put them in backwards it's probably not going to work because every keystroke the first key is going to hit or the first pad is going to hit after the second pad hits and I don't think the microprocessor is going to understand and be able to interpret that so you're not going to get any sound out of it. Placing these back in too before you do it make sure you clean everything go through it again just with a fine cloth get any dust off the surface you don't want any contamination getting back in there it could uh, possibly make this keystroke not work again in the future. To insert these back in, the best way to do it is just take a small uh, pointed object. In this case, for me, a small uh, Allen wrench fits perfectly. And you press basically in the little pads until you feel them click in. And you just go down the row, reinserting these all back in, uh, the exact orientation that they came back out. So I'll continue that and go down the entire synth, put them all back in. Uh, one last note too on the grease. So I took some cotton swabs and I kind of just rubbed away all the nasty grease that had hair and gross gunk in there. And there was still enough grease left over on the on the actual little springs that I was able to spread that around onto the remaining springs that didn't have very much grease on there. So uh, they all seem to be fine. I'm not going to have to add anything additional to them. Now that all the rubber pads are back in place, it's time to start reinserting the keys. So while the keys are out, this is a great time to clean them. You get a lot of nasty stuff on the sides and it's hard to clean them inside the actual keyboard once it's assembled. And if you actually wanted to polish it, get it a nice shine, uh, get rid of some of the small surface scratches and stuff on there, you can use a basic plastic polish similar to what you would do to uh, uh, remove scratches from, from Lexan and, and, and plexiglass and clear headlights and things like this. Those type of uh, compounds work very well, well on these plastic keys. So I'm going to go through and just clean them up a little bit further just to get the additional dirt and um, grime off the sides. This is by far the most tedious part of this uh, restore, this repair. Cleaning every single one of these keys and then laying it back into the synth. This keyboard design is quite tedious in terms of the rebuild process. Uh, at least this QS8 I did, like I talked about before. The, the board that actually the contacts is on is on the bottom of this metal chassis. So I didn't need to remove any of the keys. You just flip the whole keyboard over, unscrew the board, granted there's you know, 80 screws in that board, but then the board lifts out and you have direct access to all these contacts, all the switches. You don't have to mess with the keys at all. So it, a little bit better design. Uh, definitely a lot easier to, to service than this design with the contacts below the keys. If you ever wondered what a semi-weighted key meant when you see that in the specifications for a keyboard, it's basically this. There's a little seal weight underneath the key that Roland glues onto there so that when you press it, it's got some mass to it and it just feels better. If you've ever used a really cheap keyboard or synthesizer that just had plastic keys without the weight on there, you can feel the difference. It's, it's pretty significant. It's nowhere near a true hammer action keyboard, but it makes a big difference just for the uh, the feel when you're using it. All right, I've got it all back together, all 76 keys back in the frame for the keyboard. 
all of them filled. Well, you have to, as you're putting it together, you have to look at these springs too and make sure they're properly lined up. As I was putting it back together, a couple of them were kind of crooked in there and not quite seated correctly. So make sure you look really closely at the way that all the springs sit so that they, they are properly aligned. I'm glad I took the extra time to clean all the keys on the sides, especially because when you press a key now, the whole key is clean. You don't see any dirt or grime on the sides. It just looks really, really nice. So huge improvement from what I received. So next step is start reassembly. Hope that the cleaning I did on all the keys is good enough because once I get it back together, if the key is still dead, you gotta tear it all back apart, which is not a fun time. But I've got a pretty uh, high level of confidence that I'm not gonna see any issues, so. While I have it open here on the bench, there's something I really like about the D70 that makes it easy to work on. That is, when you have it disassembled, because there's these two long ribbon cables that connect the keyboard to the actual main board on the unit, you can pull the entire keyboard out and still have the entire unit powered on. It's nice because as you're going through and you're actually working on individual keys, pulling them out, cleaning the contacts, putting it back together, you can quickly turn it off, turn it back on, test it, and pretty much work on the whole thing and debug it while it's powered on in terms of the individual individual key contacts. A couple other little notes about the D70, one of which is the keys. So if you're looking for one of these since used or if you have one, be aware that on the keys themselves, every single one for the semi-weighted feel, there's a little piece of metal that's glued in. And in there, there's this red glue that is not going to be your friend. The reason being is that on a lot of these older synths, this glue begins to deteriorate and these weights will actually start to fall out. The second problem with that red glue, specifically with the black keys, is that because the black keys sit over the actual uh, tactile or the membrane keypad for the, all the, for the main board, or for the keyboard there, this glue, when it deteriorates, it gets liquidy and then drips down into the keyboard and gums everything up. So it gets all over the rubber contacts, it gets all over the actual metal chassis, and it makes the keys sticky and not feel well. And it can actually be corrosive to the metal too, which isn't good. So if you're looking for one of these, take a quick, quick inspection and make sure that the keys themselves, the metal pieces, haven't started to deteriorate and there's none of the glue that's dripping out of there. There is ways to remedy it, but it's just time consuming and messy. You can actually glue, you can glue the key in with silicone or some other types of caulk just to hold it in there to make sure even if the, even if the glue does start to deteriorate, it won't ooze out all over the place, but you have to do it for every single key. You can remove it completely. There's methods online where people talk about actually removing the, the red glue out of there and then they'll actually replace the, once the glue is out, they'll put the, they'll, they'll put the metal uh, semi-weighted piece of metal back inside the key with a different type of adhesive. Some people leave it out altogether just to make the problem go away. The reason it happens is a lot of people believe it's warmer climates. If, if these scents are used in hot weather or left outdoors in hot weather for long periods of time, it deteriorates. If you keep the synth indoors in a climate controlled environment, and, uh, low humidity, typically it hasn't been a problem. Before I put this all back together, I lifted this front panel board out because I wanted to see what the actual LCD display was. and It's a monster display. It's huge. So it's labeled Toshiba TLX 711A-30. So I will do some research and see if there's uh, replacements out there for it. Like I said, I've seen people on eBay selling them for about a hundred bucks, but I'm curious if I can find the original uh, supplier for it and find it cheaper elsewhere, but we will see. I'm going to leave the LCD uh, right now since I don't have one. I want to get the rest of the synth back together, back together just to verify that the, the keyboard issues are resolved first before I move forward with anything else on it. So here is the Roland D70 all reassembled. Everything is working on it. I spent some more time cleaning it up, trying to get rid of some of the corrosion on the top case. I did the best I could clean it. Some of the areas that were pitted, I actually filled with a Sharpie marker, then quickly wiped it off with a, with a soft lint cloth or a lint free cloth that has a, a little bit of uh, plastic cleaner on it. And it actually cleaned up kind of nicely. From a distance, it made it look significantly better. Close up, you can still see it's flawed and there's tiny little dark spots from the Sharpie, but it's better than seeing the, just the raw aluminum speckles all over it from the corrosion itself. In terms of the display, I did some research, and the ones on eBay for about $100 are the, actually the best deal I can find right now. I found some in the UK with the conversion were a little bit cheaper, but to ship them here it would just offset the cost anyway. So I'm not entirely concerned about it. I am somewhat disappointed. The display on this definitely looks like it was probably damaged from heat, maybe left out in the sun. 
maybe it froze, I'm not entirely sure. Looking at it straight on though, the display looks fine, other than the, just a little bit of the, the LCD bleeding from the liquid crystal you can see on it that I mentioned earlier. I haven't replaced the backlight either, I'm still planning on doing that. At this point I just wanted to get it back together so I could test it out, which I did and everything's working. Every button works too, which is happy. This has the same tactile switches that my JV80 does, among other synths, and this one seems fine. So I don't know if it's had little use, or if the buttons weren't pressed very much, or what the deal is, but I don't need to replace any of the switches, which is good. Other than that, I'm pretty happy with it. This is the first time I've actually really sat down and played with a Roland D-Series, that is a, an LA-type synthesizer. And I played with the D50 before, which I loved. Uh, it is a very, very cool synth. This one, so far, I am, I am definitely enjoying it. I'm going to spend some more time with it. I'm not going to bother going through and sampling all the sounds. There's plenty of other videos that, that have already done that. This is more just focusing on the, the technical aspects of the synthesizer. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and hopefully if you have a D70 that needs repair, this provides some insight into it. Thanks for watching.